This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. The following chapter goes through and looks at the consolidated statement of cash flows. Clearly, it's going to be examined within question number one as part of the group accounts and will be there for the standard 35 marks. It's something that gets examined maybe every two or three sittings, uh, maybe even less frequently than that. So it's not something that appears regularly. But I really want you to promise me now that you're not going to look at what's been recently examined and think, well, maybe there has been a cash flow that's been examined recently. So I'll take the chance and not revise it. And then all of a sudden it crops up within the real exam and you are screwed. OK, uh, no, you have to practice all the financial statements, position statements, performance statements. So profit or loss and OCI and this one here. If you don't practice the cash flows, then you are practicing to potentially fail the exam. Yeah, go through and have a look at the past exam questions. You will find that even though it's tricky to start off with, it is a perfectly passable, very good area to score marks upon within the exam. OK, so do go through and put in plenty of effort. So let's go through and have a look at what it's all about. Again, the little bits and pieces in here aren't within your notes until we move into what you see within your notes being the actual group statement of cash flows itself. But that's what we have there, isn't it? We've got your group structure. We've got the parent, the subsidiary and the associate. The way in which exam questions work and the way in which things work in the real life is if you think about F7 and your statement of cash flows question, you had the statement of financial position for the current year and the prior year. You then had the statement of profit or loss. And then you had to look at the movement in the various balances, whether that was the working capital balances, property, plant and equipment balances, share capital, share premium balances, the benches or loan balances to work out the inflows and the outflows. When you look at it from a group perspective, it's exactly the same. However, what you get now is a group statement of financial position and a group statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income. So the basic fundamental principles still hold from what you've seen in F7. The basic exam technique that you have from F7 still holds. However, what we need to go through and do is we need to just look at some additional cash flow items that appear based upon the fact that we are preparing the accounts now for a group and that is based on the concept of substance over legal form. There are now some additional line items that appear within the SFP and within profit or loss that give rise to additional cash flows that we have not seen previously. So if we look at that group structure there, very simple with a parent, a subsidiary and an associate. Let's just think, first of all, with regards to cash flows between the group and the outside world. That's what you're thinking about when you're preparing your group statement of cash flows. What cash flows arise between the group and those outside of the group? Well, to start off with, we look at things internally, because if S declares a dividend, then P records its share. Now, that's neither an inflow or an outflow within the group accounts in P's individual account, it will be an inflow. In S's individual account, it will be an outflow. But within the group accounts, P's share of S's dividend does not exist. However, if S is not a wholly owned subsidiary, then the non-controlling interest will get their share of that dividend. So if that's the case, there is a cash flow between the group and those outside of the group. So here, there will be an outflow based upon the non-controlling interest share of S's dividend. OK, we then go through and consider what happens if A, the associate, goes through and declares a dividend. Well, if the associate declares a dividend, again, this gives rise now to another cash flow between the group and the outside world, because the associate declares a dividend and P will record its share of that dividend. Now, what we've got to be careful of here is that that is an inflow, isn't it? Uh, the dividend paid to the non-controlling interest is an outflow. Uh, the dividend received from the associates is an inflow. OK, so there's the two things, first of all, that, that we need to go through and consider. We'll then need to consider things a little bit further 
Uh, and what we need to consider there is when we look at acquiring or disposing of a subsidiary. Because if we go through and look at that group structure there, what happens if we bring in another subsidiary? If we bring in another subsidiary, there's going to be a big cash outflow, isn't there, as we acquire that subsidiary. But do we make any adjustments for the balances that have come in on consolidation? Because now we are consolidating a new subsidiary and we need to take account of all those balances that have been acquired on acquisition. So there's going to be quite a lot to consider. So just to summarise, the, the, the three main areas that we need to consider are the dividend paid to the non-controlling interest the dividend received from the associate, and then either the acquisition or the disposal of a subsidiary. So they're the three things that we look at in the chapter first, and then we go on to build it up by looking at a full-blown group statement of cash flows example. Before we get into any of those aspects first, let's just have a look at what you've got there within the class notes, because within the class notes, you should have there right in front of you is a pro forma group statement of cash flows learn it if you don't learn it you're going to be in trouble okay that's one of the big problems that students have with regards to cash flows everybody remembers the position statement everybody remembers the performance statement people struggle when it comes to cash flows so spend a bit of time revising it so here we're essentially looking at the investing and the financing activities again if you think about what we've spoken about so far uh, within your financing activities you can see the dividend paid to the non-controlling interest so that there is in brackets, so that is an outflow. Uh, the dividend received from an associate, remember we said that is an inflow, and that goes there within your investing activities. And then you have the acquisition or the disposal of a subsidiary. If you have the acquisition of a sub, you have paid to bring the sub into your group, so there's a big cash outflow. If you've disposed of a subsidiary and got rid of it, there's going to be a nice big cash inflow uh, as you get the sales proceeds on disposal okay so there's the three main aspects that we've spoken about already uh, just to add on top of that there's some smaller little bits and pieces if you look at the top of your consolidated statement of cash flows within your operating activities you will also need to make adjustments for those non-cash items so you have to prepare the group statement of financial or sorry the group statement of cash flows under the indirect method so taking your group profit before tax and reconciling it to your cash generated from operations. And we add or deduct those non-cash items. So the common one that you can see at the top is depreciation. So that's a non-cash expense, isn't it? You've charged depreciation, which has reduced your profits, but it is not reducing cash. So therefore, we need to add it back on, don't we? Well, an impairment is exactly the same, isn't it? Uh, an impairment of goodwill within a subsidiary is a non-cash expense. So any non-cash expenses, we add them back on, don't we? Okay. Uh, likewise, uh, you've got then following your impairment. Is it the gain or loss on sale of a subsidiary? So again, in F7, we adjusted for the profit or loss on disposal of a tangible. So property, plant and equipment. Here, the same principles. We may have a gain or loss on disposal of the subsidiary. So that group profit or loss, it's just an accounting adjustment, isn't it? Accounting for the substance, the fact that we have disposed of a subsidiary. Uh, so therefore, the cash element is dealt with as a cash inflow within your investing activities with the disposal of the sub. But you need to adjust for the gain or loss on disposal. So if it's a gain, it puts profits up. We need to remove it. So deduct it. If it is a loss, that's pushed your profit down. So we need to add it back to get to our correct figure. The last figure that you've got there is looking at your share of associates profit. So remember, uh, you record your equity accounting of your associate in the statement of profit or loss as one line item, isn't it? It's there immediately before PBT. But if we start right at the very top with your group profit before tax, we need to work backwards, don't we, to get to your group operating profit. So the first thing that you go through and see there is the profit of the associate, isn't it? Now, if you've got a profit that's been added in, so you therefore need to go through, don't you, and deduct that figure. OK, so you will need to deduct that share of profit of associates to go through there and get you back. Is it 
to your operating profit. Okay. Uh, once you've done that, that's it. You'll see a lot of the things dotted around are all exactly the same. So gain or loss on disposal of tangibles, interest payable, adjustment, inventory, receivables, payables, interest paid, tax paid. So there is a lot of information that you see that has been done exactly the same from F7. So if you've mastered the technique of cash flow from F7, then you're going to be in a really good position to go through and master the technique further when we apply it to a group statement of cash flows. So I'll see you in the next video when we begin to introduce the first aspect of group cash flows, which is looking at the dividend paid to the non-controlling interest. So I'll see you all in a moment.